Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Today I thought we'd talk about be careful of the wrong tears. It could also be said beware of the wrong tears. Be careful for yourself that your tears, you have the right tears, but beware of the wrong tears from other people. Okay. So turn to Acts chapter 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Right? you got to watch. Right? Uh, be, be, uh, be watchful of the wrong tears. You know, beware of the wrong, wrong tears. Verse 30, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things and draw away disciples after them. Among us, the brethren, we have to be careful of the wrong tears. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul is warning the body of Christ with tears that there's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing trying to pose as Christians. He's warning that there's some of you that might get caught away and start promoting bad things. All right. Look what he's dealing with. First and Second Corinthians. You're dealing with uh, a lot of false converts. We've already done studies on this left and right. Okay. If you be in the faith. Okay. If a man be called a brother. If if called. Not that he is one. He's just called one. Time time again. He even has to preach the gospel to the Corinthians all over again. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. He's preaching the gospel to people he's already preached the gospel to that are professing to be saved sinners. He's preaching the gospel to them again. Okay, that's his warning. Uh, Galatians, he said, you have people coming in trying to get you back under the law. So it's no longer faith in Jesus Christ. You know, repentance, belief, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And when God saves you, you're sealed into the day of redemption. You have a changed life. No, no, no. You also have to keep the laws, the Levitical laws and everything. They're coming in saying you have to keep the laws and the faith of Jesus Christ. That will be there, the commandment of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ in the time of Jacob's trouble, but not today. Okay? So Paul's seeing people coming in and these wolves in sheep's clothing scattering the flock. He sees people that are starting to, he believes is saved, is starting to sphere off and go to the left and they're going to the right. They're not staying the course, the falling away. And he's got tears. Okay, godly sorrow. Now, there's three types of tears, brothers and sisters in Christ. There's godly sorrow, tears that come from godly sorrow. There's tears that come from worldly sorrow. <coughs> and I know this might shock some people, but there's fake tears to manipulate people. You have people that are fake and frauds and they're just manipulating people. Okay, those are the three types of of tears and before someone says something they'll be like but what about the tears of joy Psalms 126 5 says they that sow in tears shall reap in joy when you have a tears of joy as they say the world says tears of joy what are those tears based off of when I tear up because I am so grateful and thankful Lord for everything that he's given to me this property the clothes on my back the food in my stomach these glasses given me his perfect written word, the King James Bible, that's based off of godly sorrow. I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy. Lord, thank you for this. I, the life I was living before you saved me, I don't deserve this. Even as a saved sinner, I make mistakes and fall flat on my face. I don't deserve any of this. When you give God glory in all things and you give him thanks in all thin things, you realize that he is up here and you're down here. <laughs> That's the whole point of the tears of joy. So for someone to say, what about the fourth one, the tears of joy? I put it under godly sorrow. You know your place, and you know God's place. And you hold it. You know your word's place, and you know God's place, His words. You put His words above all things. And you're like, Lord, thank you for everything, Lord. Today was an amazing day, Lord. Praise you, O oh Lord. It's not today's amazing day because of me, and I deserve it, and everything. No, it's because of you, Lord. That's where those tears of joy come from. Okay? They that sow tears shall reap in joy. When you have godly sorrow, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, godly sorrow, and that's where those tears are coming from, it'll lead to joy. 
How many brothers and sisters in Christ out there can testify to that? Right. So let's start with the first one, godly sorrow. Remember, we're looking at ourselves, and we're, I'm warning you to watch other people that are trying to come in and deceive you. Okay. And they do it with tears. They do it with tears. Let's start with the good tears. Godly sorrow. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Let's look at a great example of God tears that come from godly sorrow. Okay? Being sorry in your heart, O wretched man that I am, for your state and how you've treated God. You've wronged him. You've sinned against him. Luke, 3, Luke 7, chapter 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat, sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharaoh's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Notice it says, which was a sinner. So whoever's writing this, which is Luke, I believe, he even knew she was a sinner. Everybody knew she was a sinner. That's how bad of a sinner she was. You know, sin is sin, but you know what I'm saying? How abundantly of a sinner she was, if you want to say it that way. And stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears. There we see tears, and we see weeping. And did wipe them with the hair of her head, and kiss his feet, and anoint them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. He knew he, she was a sinner. Okay. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, which one of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. I'm going to stop there for a second. It almost sounds like he's comparing that man to that woman when it comes to the person who forgave 50 versus 500. You know, look how grateful she is. And look how grateful you were. Okay. 45. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are are forgiven. Godly sorrow. Tears that come from godly sorrow is because they know, I know I'm a sinner, but I have sorrow in my heart for sinning against God. I don't want to sin against God anymore. And I am so ashamed of my sins that I personally committed against my Creator. Okay? That's what's going on here. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Here's where we read it. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. Not that you were made sorry. Okay? As we keep going down, we're going to find other examples where people were sorry, but they didn't sorrow to repentance. Right? It's not this, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. Yeah, we're a sinner, you're a sinner, all are a sinner. No, but that you sorrowed to repentance, that you came personally to Jesus Christ saying, I am sorry for my personal sins against you. Okay. But you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner. That's the difference. Not a worldly manner, we're going to get to that one, but a godly manner. That you might receive damage by us in nothing, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to repent it of, but the sorrows of the world worketh dread. You say, well, how do we know that her sorrow was world, uh, godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow? Well, Matthew 3, 8 says, Bring there forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. If those tears are godly sorrow, God's going to come in when they get saved. Even if to, for a saved sinner, if those tears are godly sorrow, there's going to be a change. 
whatever's causing those tears, you're going to say, Lord, get that out of my life. Right? Drunkenness, I'm destroying my life. I'm destroying my relationships. I'm destroying my marriage. Get that drunkenness out of my life, Lord. That's godly sorrow. All right? Get it out of my life. Getting high. Okay? Feminism. Video games. Movies. TV shows. Uh, anime. Cartoons. You know? Secular style music. Fornicate. Whatever it is that's destroying your life, if it's truly godly sorrow and you're truly, and you come and you get saved, God saves you, you're going to be like, Lord, get that out of my life. And you're going to have fruits meet for repentance. There's going to be a changed life. You're going to start saying, Lord, tell me what to do. Tell me what not to do. <coughs> you see people crying later on. Is there a change in their life? Then you know it's godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 13.5 We give Paul, remember he's crying night and day with tears trying to warn people. All right. 2 Corinthians 13.5, examine yourselves, this is to the Corinthians, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. You have to prove it. It's not just words, you prove it. Prove your own selves. You know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. We've proven we're not reprobates. Okay, we've been approved by people that were not reprobates. You need to prove yourself. So when someone has tears, you don't just take them at the tears, period. Look at their life that they're living. On, online, I can tell, brothers and sisters Christ, online it's very hard to tell how someone's living online. Someone can get behind the camera and just tell you what you want to hear. It's hard. But the Holy Spirit in you is going to let you know. God would not warn us and tell us to examine ourselves and then tell us to uh, hear that... He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged no man. Then tells us, okay, you've looked at yourself and judged yourself. Now you need to look at what's around you. Are these people brethren? The lost world. I don't know if that's picking up on the mic, but there's some dogs howling down there. I apologize for that. Okay. Turn to 2 Corinthians 7, 11. Okay. We're going to go back to chapter 7 again, and instead of stopping at 10, we're going to keep going. Because people think, well, repentance, yeah, you can have some sorrow, but there doesn't have to be evidence that you repented. Well, we read 9 and 10. We'll read it again. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Let's keep going. Verse 11. For behold, this selfsame things that, she, that ye sorrowed after, past tense, now you've already repented, past tense, what carefulness it wrought in you, there's a change. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. I always point that out because when I truly got saved, I was angry. I was angry at the life I was living, being a false convert. I was angry about all the people that lied to me and deceived me. Okay. What indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal. You have a zeal for God's word, you have a desire to please Him. God, tell me what to do and I'm going to do it. Okay. What revenge, in all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Approved. There's proof. Fruits meet for repentance. So when you got people with these tears, oh, I'm just so sorry. You look at them and go, well, if you're truly godly sorrow, let's start with us, with me. If I'm truly sorry, then why am I still doing it? Whatever's causing me to tear up, why am I still doing that? Why am I still living that way? Lord, help me change my, get that out of my life. Lord, I don't want that in my life. Get that out of my life, Lord. Oh, I'm supposed to be doing this, Lord. I'm going to be doing this. Now with the world, when you look out there and you see people, oh, they're tearing up and... Oh, it's just, it's getting so emotional and everything. It's like, but look at their life. They're still a drunkard. They're still high. They're still into feminism. Video games, movies, TV. So they're still a deadbeat for the men. They're not taking care of their family. Whatever it is, you look at them, there's no change. No change whatsoever. They've destroyed their lives. The wages of sin is death. And they destroyed their lives is that where the tears are coming from? Worldly sorrow. Let's go on over to worldly sorrow. Turn to 
turn to Numbers 11.1. 1. I have two examples. One's the best example, but God pointed something else out to me, okay? Two types of worldly sorrow. There's worldly sorrow because you just sin against God, sin against God, and you don't care. But there's also worldly sorrow when it comes to the flesh, the carnal things like, I want a boat that's a million dollar boat or a $20 million jet or I'd like to have this, they're, they're getting expensive, $60,000 truck. You know, it's almost the price of what a house used to cost. And in some states, it's, it's more than what a house costs. So he turned me to, he showed me Numbers 11. Turn to Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. We'll start there. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second. They did something where they, had, they whined and weeped and complained about something that was worldly sorrow, and they got punished. Now let's see what's going to happen after this. And he called the name of the place Tiberia, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again. Again. It's not the first time. They wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Stop there. How many times do you wish that you could eat two meals exactly the same? It's easy. You do something, you throw it together, and then you get back to doing work. And it has everything you need, all the vitamins, everything you could possibly want in it. That's what this manna had in it. Anything, everything that they needed was there. And people, when it comes to being content with food and raiment, how many of you are like me? You don't have to be like me, but I'm saying, I eat the same breakfast every morning, the same lunch every day for the most part, and then I have three or four different types of dinner meals that I cycle around through. I mean, I don't have such a huge like menu of what I eat all the time. You know, Could you be happy with two meals a day and both meals being exactly the same? Could you live off that and be content and praise God? Some people say yes, yes, but I know people who will say yes that there's no way they could. They whine and complain just like these people are. Okay? That's why, what's going on? They're fleshly, worldly sorrow. Verse 7, And the manna was a coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of dillium, bedillium or dillium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in mortars, and baked it in pans, and made cakes of it, and the taste of it was of the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Okay. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. You say, well, that's just the Lord, because my first question I'd ask you, brothers and sisters, Christ, why isn't your attitude towards this the same way? When you see people with worldly sorrow, why don't you get angry at them? You preach the truth, I mean, preach the truth to them first, preach the gospel, teach them, you know, but they just reject the gospel. Why, why are you still feeling sorry for them and tearing up for them? Why aren't you angry? The Lord is. Is that the only thing? It says Moses here, that's ended. Moses also was displeased. Why aren't you displeased? If you don't want to be angry, why aren't you displeased? The Bible says that you can be angry with someone with a cause. It says you're not to be angry with someone without a cause. You've preached the truth. I have family members. I have neighbors, friends I've preached the gospel to, and they reject it for this world. And some of them have made a complete, utter mess of their lives and destroyed their lives, and they've got worldly sorrow, and they're whining, and they're weeping, and they're complaining, but they won't listen to you. They won't listen to the Word of God. And you got these people who are like, oh, we just got to have love and love. No, you should be angry. You should be displeased with that person, frustrated with that person. Absolutely. God does. Psalm 7 11 says, God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every 
day. You know, God can get angry at me. He looks at me and goes, why are you doing that? You gave that up for me. It's sin. It's wickedness. Why are you falling back into that? Why are you doing that? He gets angry. And then he'll chastise me if I don't repent. Okay. God gets angry. My thing is, is with this whole movement in the world, the Babel building system, and you see, I come across people, oh, that's a great t-shirt, that's a great sweater, I love it. And I start talking with them, and they don't love the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They don't love God's Word. But they're all, this whole world is just about preaching love and peace and joy. Everything that's positive, love, peace, joy. What about God's wrath? What about God's judgment? Okay. What about spiritual sacrifices? Sacrifice, you mean I have to give something up? That's negative. Okay. God is angry with the wicked every day. Luke 16, 14. You can keep reading that. It talks about he bent his bow. But I'm just talking about the part that he's, he's angry with these people. They're fleshly, they're worldly, and their sorrow is based off the world. They have no gratitude towards Jesus Christ. Back then, it's the angel of the Lord. God. All right. Jesus who is God. But you understand, Old Testament versus New Testament. Luke 16, 14. If you turn to Luke 16, 14. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. That's what a lot of these uh, sorrow when we get into the fake tears, but sometimes these tears, even if they're genuine, but they're based off of worldly sorrow, it's to justify themselves before men. Okay? To put on a good show. But God knoweth your hearts. God knoweth the heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Drunkenness in this world today, highly esteemed above men, abomination in the sight of God. Getting high, feminism, video games, movies, Hollywood movies and TV shows, anime, okay? I'd even go as far as to say technology today. Everybody just, there's so many people out there that are worshiping technology. You can get to the point where you can get lazy. Technology is there to help you get lazy. All right. Not all technology is bad, but I'm just saying for the most part, there's some technology, hey, you buy this thing, it costs you 2000 to get you in debt or waste your savings, and you can get that job done in half the time. See what I'm saying? Well, then what I do with the other half the time? Play video games, watch movies, you know, be tempted to do things you're not supposed to do instead of keeping your hands busy. You know what I'm saying? All right. Things that are esteemly, esteemed among men, highly esteemed among men, is an abomination in the sight of God. These Babel buildings, organized religion, highly esteemed among men. Even lost people who reject Jesus Christ highly esteem those, those buildings. Yeah, those are church buildings. That's where people go worship. Yeah, that's okay. They can do it if they want to. It's pretty cool that they do that over there. It's highly esteemed among men, yet everybody, there's people out there that just defend, defend, defend these Babel buildings. These pagan temples made with hands. Okay. It's abomination, especially in these last days. But if you keep reading in the Old Testament, we read Numbers, but if you keep reading the Old Testament, Jewish people kept complaining about things and whining and weeping and tears. And it was all worldly sorrow. Their gratefulness never lasted. Oh, okay, thank you, because they got the quails. Oh, we got quails, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it didn't last. They found something else to whine about and weep and tear and, and have tears about right. uh, it was superficial it's fake and you'll see that from people it's superficial it's fake it doesn't last long their great gratitude towards to the Lord doesn't last long I still thank him I've been here four years and I still thank him for almost everything I can possibly think of I've been here four years and my biggest prayer is that I never get used to living here like I take it for granted like this is my home I, I deserve to be here and and no it's a blessing. Thank you, Lord. But you get those people that never last. They find something to whine about. Something to weep and be teary-eyed about. Worldly sorrow. Okay. And remember, it wasn't not long before they... It wasn't long before they had worldly sorrow about something else. But don't forget that God it was so... They were so bad that God's like, 40 years. 
It was all about them going in and taking over. They didn't trust God. That was like the final straw. You don't trust me that you, I can give you the land that I promised you. You guys, I'm done. 40 years. Wipe out everybody who remembered the flesh, the worldly sorrow people. No matter how they mentioned all this stuff they had back in Egypt, you're done. I'm going to have a new, pe new set of people, the younger people that grow up. They're going to go in there. And I think Joshua and another guy that believed one of the, the two out of the... I think the 12 spies that were sent in, only two of them said, yes, we can take it. Trust the Lord. He says we can take it. We can take it. They got to see it too, the promised land. But that's how bad they were. It was worldly sorrow based on physical things, physical pleasures. Right? Those are the wrong kinds of tears. That's the wrong kind of weeping. Now, let's talk about the ultimate person in the Bible that had the ultimate example of worldly sorrow. Turn to Romans chapter 9, verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now remember we read up there, God is angry with the wicked every day. God was angry with those people. They were worldly, they were fleshly, they had worldly sorrow. But here's a guy that God hated. He wasn't just angry with them, he hated them. Let's find out why. But first, let's go to Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, with, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you. Now remember, he was written to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. And thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicators or profane persons, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Why did he have the tears? He sought repentance, but he couldn't find it. True biblical repentance. The repentance that leads to salvation. You couldn't find it. Makes you wonder why not. Uh, turn back to Genesis 25, chapter 25, verse 28. Let's, talk, let's read about Esau. He sold his birthright. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. Flesh. I mean, it's flesh, but you know what I'm talking about. It's just, it's, he loved him because of that. But Rebekah loved Jacob, and Jacob saw pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Now, we've said it before, I've said it before. He's not on his deathbed. He's not dragging himself in to town. Okay? That's not there. He walked in, he was faint, he's hungry, he's thirsty, he's very fleshly. Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. 31, I'm sorry. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do me? He's not at the point to die, he's just very fleshly. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He despised it. Okay. I have to keep saying this, uh, brothers and sisters Christ. Yes, he dishonors his parents. He keeps going on and continues and continues to dishonor God and sin against God without a care in the world. He has no conviction whatsoever. He dishonors his parents. And he despised his birthright. But the reason he lost the best blessing is because he sold his birthright. He gave it up. It wasn't nothing to him. What's the birthright of a Bible-believing? Kind of gives it away. Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman? Right here. King James Bible. You get saved. This gets put in a place that's so high. Lord, tell me what to do and I'm going to do it. This book, I'm going to be in it every day. I'm going to study it every day. And I'm going to follow it and live it every day. This is our birthright. 
Time and time again, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. It's because we have a birthright. We have a perfect written word of God today in English, the King James Bible. That's the only way we were able to believe. I can go off on a tangent. I don't want to because there's people that say, well, I've been saved for 30 years, but God only brought me to the King James Bible a year ago. You weren't saved 30 years ago. I don't care what anybody says. How can you be saved without having the true plan of salvation? God would let you wander for 29 years without his word. No sanctification, no changed life. Anyway, like I said, that's a whole other thing. But brothers and sisters in Christ, you have Esau. Turn to Malachi 1, chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel to Malachi. So, sometimes, sometimes it feels like a burden because when you're trying to preach the word to people, people don't want to hear it. And it can feel like a burden sometimes. Uh, verse 2, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Let that sink in, brother and sister of Christ. Why was Esau seeking repentance night and day with tears and never finding it? He refused to have godly sorrow. He continues to live however he wants to live, and his whole world is being destroyed. His life is miserable. It's worldly sorrow. How many people do we see that today? Professing Christians who say, I'm saved, and you look at their life, it's a complete mess. They keep living their life the way they want to live it. They ignore God's word. And here you see these tears. Poor me. They destroyed their lives. The wages of sin is death. How many of us have seen people with tears like that before? I have. How many of us are talking about when they raise their hand and says, I have, they're talking about themselves? I've had worldly tears before as a professing Christian, a false convert, a fake, a fraud. I destroyed my life many a times. God was bringing me down saying, hey, here's an opportunity. Are you going to seek me? Are you going to have godly sorrow and seek absolute truth? Nope. They, I'm just so blessed he brought me to my knees several times in my life. He didn't give up on me. Praise the Lord. And God doesn't give up on people, but God will get to a point where you reject him enough. He'll be like, you don't want me and you want the world? Fine. No longer knocking. You can have the world. I believe that. All right. That's why it's scary when you're dealing with a professing Christian that's rejected the real Jesus Christ most of their life. They're hard to deal with. But you've got Esau here. God is destroying his life, destroying his life, bringing him to his knees to say, hey, you need to repent. Have godly sorrow. King David did. Saul didn't. King Saul. And we can keep going. Uh, Judas Iscariot, the traitor, he had worldly sorrow. After he was condemned and saw that he was condemned, he was just sorrow for the consequences. Esau, his life was destroyed, and you see people like that. They keep destroying their lives with alcohol, with cigarettes, with weed, okay? uh, movies, TV shows, video games, fornication, sodomy, whatever you want to talk about their lifestyle is. They're destroying their lives, and they're weeping because of it. And you go to tell them about Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ can can cleanse that sin away, He can heal you, He can change your life and give you a better life. And they don't want it. You have professing Christians who claim to be saved, but they don't want it. They don't want the change life. They love living the life, they love their sin. But what does that sin bring? Destruction. It brings death. The wages of sin is death. And what's our attitude towards these people? Oh, those poor, poor people. Was that God's attitude? No, God was angry at those types of people. You know, Moses was displeased with those types of people. If you say we shouldn't be angry at them, 
then why aren't you displeased with them? Why don't you have the attitude of, wake up? You won't listen to me? Then get out of my way. Don't waste my time. I want to talk to somebody who will listen. Why isn't that our attitude? Most of us, brothers and sisters of Christ, that is our attitude. Sometimes we can fall into the trap. Even Paul, he said, I'm done with you Jews. I'm going to go preach to the Gentiles. He still went back and preached to the Jews sometimes when the, pre when the opportunity presented itself. He didn't give up completely. I'm not saying give up completely. But my point is, is there comes a time where they're not listening. Go talk to somebody else that will listen. That's what Paul did. I'm going to the Gentiles. They were listening. They were around the synagogue saying, hey, can you tell us about this next week? Can you tell us more about what you're talking about, this Jesus, next week? They wanted to hear. The Jewish people at the time, most of them didn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. Worldly sorrow. Be careful. Don't fall for those tears. Look at their life. Is there a change? I'm sorry, Lord, that I played those video games. Are you still playing those video games? Lord, I'm just so sorry tearing up. I've destroyed my life with drunkenness and with weed and cigarettes and feminism. And Lord, I'm so sorry. Is there a change in their life? Are they still a drunkard? So a brother in Christ corrected me. Alcohol, I, just, I, I try to get that out of my vocabulary. Alcoholism, you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic. The Bible word is drunkard. Drunkenness, you're a drunkard. Are you still a drunkard? Are you still getting drunk? Well, yeah, I, I am. And then that's worldly sorrow, or you're faking it. Because that drunkenness is destroying your life, it's destroying your relationships. The we, I mean, we can go through anything. It's destroying your relationship with people, it's destroying your life. If you're truly saved, it's destroying your walk with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, one question I'd ask real quick before we move on with Esau. Why could not Esau find repentance, though he sought it night and day with tears? If it's just admitting that you're a sinner, I mean, it's just acknowledging your lost state, then why couldn't Esau, who was seeking repentance night and day with tears, why couldn't he find it? Well, 2 Corinthians, turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. We're going to go through this again. Now I rejoice, that, not that you were made sorry. I'm not rejoicing because of your sad countenance and your sad condition. There's another way to look at that. But that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But here's what answers the question for Esau. But the sorrows of the world worketh death. His sorrow was not based off of God. I'm sorry towards God. His sorrow was based off the world, his, the consequences of how his world was falling apart. He wanted to live in sin, 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 but there's a consequence to that life. Right? There's no peace. There's no true peace and there's no true joy. You've got to get that next fix. You've got to get that next fix. We've got to keep, we've got to keep your flesh fled. We've got to keep feeding your flesh. You've got to keep it fled. You've got that next fix, that next fix. If it all came to a stop, it seems like your world fell apart. Everything comes tumbling down. Okay. Just wanted to point that out. It's not just admitting. There's brothers and sisters of Christ. There's some of you out there that on your channel, through your salvation messages, I'm starting to realize you're starting to throw things on there like just admit you're a sinner. It's part of your salvation message. Or just state your sinful nature or whatever. You need to get that fixed. It's not. The lost world commit, admits that they're sinners. It's having godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. That's the key. Are they sorry? You're supposed to be telling people, you need to be sorry for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. Not the consequences. You need to be sorry that you've sinned against God. Your personal sins. Not sins in general, not just the sinful state. Your personal sins. And when you come to God like that, there will be tears. There's no tears? Yeah, that's a problem. Now, I wanted to give you one quick example. Like I said, this was supposed to be a quick study, but then God gave me verse with example that even though it doesn't use the word reaping and tears, I want to give you an example how someone can use emotions, and I believe that she was using tears when we talk about this, to manipulate people. They're fake. 
and they use them to manipulate people. So turn to Judges chapter 16, verse 1. How many people know about Samson and Delilah? Right. Judges 61, Then went Samson to Geza, and saw there was a harlot, and went in unto her. And it was told the Gezites, saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. This is part where Samson started getting to the point where he got too prideful, taking for granted what God was doing for him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterwards that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, and said unto her, enticing him, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we have may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. Right? And we will give thee, every one of us, eleven hundred pieces of silver. They're bribing her. And Delilah said, Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightst be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, if, thy, if they bind me with seven green wish, withs that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green withs, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there, was, now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the wits, as a thread of tow is broken when it toucheth the fire. So his strength was not known. Okay, it's the first time it happened. Could have been a fluke. These men are just happened to be lying wait in the chamber. just happened to be here. Could be a fluke. Verse 10, And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, Wherewith thou, mightest, wherewith thou mightest be bound. I don't think there's tears at this point. She's not putting on a show yet, but she's like, come on, stop playing around with me. Tell me what it is. And he said unto her, If thy bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as the other man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him wherewith, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber. And he break them off his arms like a thread. This is the second time. Uh, at this point, he shouldn't have been around this woman. Get away from me. How are these guys are getting in here? Why do you keep pressing me about this? Verse 13. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. I think there's little tears by now. Tell me wherewith thou mightst be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web, and she fastened it with the pin, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he walked out of his sleep, and he, I'm sorry, walked out, <laughs> and he awaked out of his sleep, and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say that I love thee, when thy heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. I, I could just picture her. She's just starting to sob and put on a big, sto a big show and everything. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. That he told her all her heart, and she said unto, and he said unto her, there hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like other men. Another man. Other man. She got what she wanted. Yeah, people can use tears to be fake. They can use emotions to be fake. 
to deceive people to get what they want, which she wants. She wanted that money. She didn't love Samson. She wanted the money. And what gets me, brothers and sisters in Christ, the worst thing that can happen, I've been talking to some of the brethren, the worst thing that can happen to somebody, there's people out there that their tears are fake, and then the tears that are genuine, they're worldly sorrow, and the two things that they want to hear more than anything is this. They want to hear you tell them that they're a good person and that they're a brother or sister in Christ. That's all they want to hear. And if they won't hear it from us, the true Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, they will turn their back on this Word of God. They'll turn their back on the true plan of salvation to go hang out with the easy believers of the crowd. Because over there, they get told they're a good person. They don't have to have a changed life. You don't have to have godly sorrow for your sins that you've sinned against Him. It's only belief. God just had, it's all about God's love and you live however you want to live. Over there, they get to hear that they're a good person and they get a pat on the back being called brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what they want to hear. And we're seeing that more and more among the body of Christ. People that turn their back and they go and they fall. I honestly don't think it's fallen away, honestly. I think a lot of them are lost. They were able to hide out here, pretending to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, until somebody comes along and kicks their sin, kicks the way they're living their life. Because online, you can put a big up, you can put up a big show online. People say, "What about me?" I, I could. I'm just telling you, I'm being honest. I've shown you videos. You know, um, I try my best to live a godly life. But yes, anybody online can be put on a big show. But that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, and that's where the Word of God comes in. Does their life line up with the Word of God? Okay, It's tough online. It's so easy to be deceived online. Okay, These people, it's the worst thing that could ever happen to them is that they're told that they're a good person and they're told that they are truly a sister or a brother in Christ. It's the worst thing that can happen to them. Chances of them getting saved now are very slim. My prayer for them is that they get saved. But it's very slim. And they come on, you'll see a lot of them come on and do videos and stuff and they just got those fake tears. Or, like that we just read about Delilah, because they want, they're trying to get something. What are they getting? They want people to feel sorry for them and to pat them on the back and say, Oh, you're a good person. You are a sister or brother in Christ. Then you've got people that get on that have those tears that are like uh, Esau. The tears are real, but it's based off of worldly sorrow. They don't have no intention of changing their life. They love their sin. They love feeding their flesh. They have no intention of changing their life. Yet you'll see those tears. And once again, the tears of joy. The tears of joy is only possible because of true biblical repentance. Godly sorrow is the only way true joy, if you want to call them tears of joy, is possible. You realize, I don't deserve this, Lord. This is amazing. Thank you, Lord. I don't deserve this. Thank you, thank you, Lord. To God be the glory. You did this, not me. Uh, ending note, we're going to talk about two verses. Start with, Re turn to Revelation 21. Here's an encouragement to the brethren, brethren in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is talking about saved people. This is only for saved people. 21, Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and shall be and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Former things are passed away. All our tears for saved sinners are going to get wiped away. And I always ask people this, think about the judgment, uh, the great white throne judgment. The great white throne where Jesus is going to be sitting, who is God the Father. They're not sitting on each other's lap, sorry Trinitarians. Jesus Christ himself is the one on the throne. He's the one doing the judging. Sorry, Chick Tracks, you like to put God the Father as some ghostly image sitting on a throne. It's Jesus Christ on that throne. Okay, because He is God the Father. 
He's going to be judged in the great white throne, and all these people are going to be coming, and they're going to have tears galore, worldly sorrow, and we're going to be sitting there. Some people say, well, we're going to be crying and everything. I believe all of our tears are mainly going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. When we're sitting there, we're going to have the mind of Christ. God's going to show us their hearts. We're supposed to have the same attitude that God had. We'd be angry at these people. You rejected your Creator. You chose the world over Jesus Christ. You chose alcohol over Jesus Christ. Cigarettes, weed, video games, movies, TV shows, fornication, whatever. You chose that over Jesus Christ. We should be displeased with them and we should be angry at them. Someone says, what if someone comes up that you failed to pre witness to? Well, God will give you, you know, the mind of Christ, know their heart. Someone else came in and preached to them. You might have failed. But that's what you're going to be answering for at the judgment seat of Christ. But at the great white throne, they're the ones that are going to have a lot of tears that are based off of worldly sorrow. And we're all going to be sitting there going, why didn't, in our hearts, we're going to be angry. Why didn't you give your life to Christ? Why didn't you repent and have godly sorrow and believe in Jesus Christ? Why would you reject the truth, God's perfect written word? We're going to be angry, I believe. We're going to be displeased with those people. All right. We're going to have the mind of Christ. Their tears, if you want to say get wiped, don't get wiped away. They get tossed into the lake of fire. There shall be wailing, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. That goes on. But for us who are saved, there's going to come a point where our tears get wiped away. No more tears. Praise the Lord. I look forward to that day. All right. Now I'm going to leave you with this verse, 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Brothers and Christ, anyone that says, I am a Christian, is a prophet. Why? You say, how does that play out? When I preach the gospel to somebody, I'm telling them their future. They reject Jesus Christ, refuse to have godly sorrow, and repent and they try to just skip it or ignore it or refuse to do anything, they skip repentance, they refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, the one you have to repent and then believe, okay? You're going to hell to burn for all eternity. Going to hell and then tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. That's future prophecy. Hey, we're in the last days. Jesus is coming back for his bride any day now. That's future prophecy. We're all prophets. Okay, so when you've got people claiming, hey, I'm Christian, I'm a Christian, and they're telling you you don't have to repent, oh, there's no hell, or hell isn't that big of a deal, or Jesus might have already come in the past, or he's not coming until the end of the, you know what I'm saying? These are false prophets. They're not real Christians. They're fakes, they're frauds. And for the subject we're talking about here when it comes to tears, beloved, believe not every spirit. Just because they have tears, I've seen videos where people are on there talking and you have people getting on there and they're tearing up and everything and they're like, oh, your brother and sister of Christ and everything. And you're like, but they have no testimony. They didn't say the gospel they got saved off. They didn't say it. And you're looking at it and you're like, but you're calling them a brother or sister in Christ. The Bible warns us. That's why I were, there's probably brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are wondering, well, why doesn't he call me brother or sister in Christ? I have made mistakes in my past, and I've called people brothers and sisters in Christ without trying the spirits. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Without making sure that their life lines up with this. So now I'm very cautious. I'm not saying you're lost because I don't call you a brother and sister in Christ. I'm just very cautious today. And so should you be. Okay. We shouldn't be throwing around brother and sister in Christ like it's toilet paper. Of course, after the pandemic <laughs> it did become scarce but you know what I'm saying we don't just throw it around like it's easy peasy someone says hey I'm a brother or sister in Christ the first thing I want to know is where's your testimony I want to I want to hear your testimony I want to see if you did a video I want to see your testimony I'd love to see even though you don't feel like you're called into ministry to do videos and stuff like that it'd still be nice to hear I like people when they email me testimonies I'd love to see you do a video just a short video, it could be 10 minutes, explaining your testimony, and it's on your channel, and it can be the only video that's on your channel. Okay? But beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. 
Remember what we read before, you have to prove your own selves. You gotta prove it. You listen to their testimony and you look at the life they're living. That's how you can tell if someone's truly saved. And today, since we're so spread out and we're on camera, it's hard to see the life they're living to see if it lines up with their words. Remember, whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. They both go hand in hand. But we're spread so thin and with technology and everything, it's so easy to be deceived. It really is. Okay? So, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Remember, the three things of the tears. And people say, what about tears of joy? Remember again, tears of joy come from godly sorrow. When you had godly sorrow in your heart, and you're sitting there, and you're t you have tears because of godly sorrow, you'll, when God gives joy in your life, that tears are there. Lord, I don't deserve it. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. You saved me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is amazing. This day was just an amazing day. You blessed me, oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's because you know you don't deserve it. It's a blessing. It's a gift of God. Okay? It's that simple. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, keep your guard up in these last days. Someone gets behind the camera or someone's trying, you, you run into somebody downtown and they're crying and everything. Be careful. Okay? Don't fall for a, uh, a Delilah. Okay? Don't fall for a Delilah. And don't fall for a Esau. Okay? Make sure it's genuine. You say, how do you find out if it's genuine? Next time you see that person, are they still living the same life that they lived? Has anything changed? Nope, they're still living the same life they live. They still have those tears. It's worldly sorrow. It's that simple. So, hopefully this has encouraged you, brothers and sisters of Christ, to check your own life to make sure that your tears are godly sorrow. The tears of joy are based off godly sorrow. Okay? Thank you, Lord for giving me a new life. This new life you've given me, I'm doing my best to obey your word and live your word, and it's just, you've given me joy. That's how you get joy from the Lord and true peace. When you truly come in a repentant state, God changes your life and he gives you joy and he gives you peace. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.